Hi there, my name is Pete Gilbert and for the last 30 years, uh, which has gone quicker than I could ever have imagined, I've had the privilege of being uh, part of a team where I serve the team by leading it, which has delivered the DNA program, which is a church-based program of discipleship. Our heart and our passion is to see women and men of God uh, recognized and released and resourced so they become more whole because all of us are broken and as they become more whole they actually become more fruitful for God. We want to do that through serving the life of local church because we believe that church is God's primary agent for the building of his kingdom and also for evangelism and if for evangelism therefore for discipleship because the call of the Great Commission which we'll look at a little bit more detail in a few moments time is not about creating converts but about making disciples and so DNA exists as a discipleship journey year on year and over those 30 years now we've had the enormous privilege of being involved in hands-on shaping of well over 1200 women and men of God we are still in contact with most of them they're going on with God they're in positions of leadership within their churches and within their community 80% of them in positions like that uh, and, and attributing that directly to how God got his hands on them during their DNA journey. It would be our absolute delight if we could serve you and your church and your church people in such a similar way. So I wanted to take the opportunity to just for a few minutes to reflect on the nature of discipleship and to explain a little bit about uh, what I perceive to be the some of the essences of New Testament discipleship. Uh, I'm going to actually suggest to you that there are uh, five things that the, the New Testament evidences when it comes to discipleship, each one of which has implications on my life, uh, on your life, uh, and also on the life of those in your church that you would seek to see become uh, more whole and therefore more fruitful. So five key elements to do with the nature of New Testament discipleship. I think the first thing I'd like to say uh, about discipleship uh, is that it's, it's, although it's a buzzword today, and it seems to me as I have the privilege of working across many churches uh, around the UK uh, and sometimes further afield than that, discipleship is something of a buzzword. But the question really is, are we landing it? Are we unpicking and unpacking it? Do we know what it's like to live lives of, of discipleship? And so the first proposition I have about the nature of, of New Testament discipleship is this, that discipleship is utterly biblical it is not simply fanciful or stylistic in some way it's not the domain of DNA because you know hey that's what they've done for 30 years it's not the latest in thing to talk about as churches it's not just something that we create training schemes around which let's face it are endless it's about a lifestyle lived in copying as faithfully as we can in the power of the Holy Spirit, the life of Christ himself. So here's my first proposition. Discipleship is utterly biblical. It's not fanciful. It's not stylistic. It's rooted in scripture. And if we were to pause for anything more than just a few moments, I think it would not be difficult to start to come up with examples of discipleship from the Bible. And interestingly, of course, although we might perhaps naturally tend to fly to the New Testament, across the whole of the Bible, not just the New Testament, discipleship was an Old Testament as well as a New Testament principle, and there were models for it in both the Old and New Testament. In fact, what Jesus does with his disciples, which is where our thinking might start, in the New Testament is based on a rabbinical model that you actually find in the Old Testament. So if we let our minds wander uh, a little bit as to the nature of biblical discipleship, I think we'd probably quite quickly start coming up with names. We might start to think, for example, uh, about Moses and his little team and the extent to which he was uh, shepherding them, that he was discipling them. We might want to think about uh, e Elijah, this, this uh, rather mysterious shadowy figure who comes down from the mountains. We don't know too much about his background. He's rather strangely dressed. All sorts of odd things start to happen around him as you read through those books in the Old Testament in, in 1 and 2 Kings. Uh, but, the, but the key for Elijah is that there is an Elisha. 
that Elisha, a younger man, sees something of God in Elijah that he really wants. He wants what he wants what Elijah has got, and even more. And so e- e- Elisha. Uh, who's a bit of a canny old bird really, uh, kind of catches hold, metaphorically speaking, of Elijah's t- cold, uh, coattails. He, and he, he starts to follow him. And now Elijah, of course, recognises this and, uh, and pushes Elisha a little bit. So, so if I go here, would you, would you come with me? Oh, and if I go there, would, what about if I cross over into this culture where you don't feel quite so comfortable and so safe? Would you cross over the Jordan with it? And Elisha, yes, I would, yes, I would, yes, I would. And we get to that uh, supreme moment, don't we, at the end of Elijah's uh, time on earth, because uh, rather peculiar within scripture, he is one of the few people who was and then was not, he walked with God. Uh, and Elijah takes off his cloak, like symbolically saying to Elisha, and now I give to you a double portion of my mantle, of my cloak, of my authority. That was a discipling relationship. And, and we might think of the Moses and the Joshua's or the Elijah's and the Elijah. We might think into the New Testament, of course, where there are many examples, supremely, I suppose, uh, Jesus with the 12 disciples but you know even even that model would you perhaps usefully uh, and provocatively take some breaking down so we have Jesus and the 12 but within the 12 we can see a pattern that emerges as to how Jesus discipled 12 is quite a lot of people to disciple but within the 12 we have the three Peter James and John, uh, sometimes referred to as the triumvirate, as, as you and I read through the Gospels, we begin to realise that this threesome uh, are exposed to experiences and exposed to teaching which the rest of the disciples don't actually have. It's as though somehow Jesus is pouring particular time and energy uh, and detail, uh, uh, inspiration and impartation. Uh, into those three disciples but but we could you know I think we could hone that down even more and learn something even further about the Jesus method of discipleship because within the 12 there were the three but within the three there was the one and so of Peter James and John we we have John who I think actually quite humbly uh, in his own writings refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Not that Jesus didn't love the other disciples, but there seems to have been a particular connection, a particular bond. I've I've speculated much on that and what that might be, and scripture's not necessarily overt about this, but I have wondered in looking at some of the other writings of John, which tend to center much around love, whether that was something that Jesus was seeing and wanted to draw out of John even further in that one-to-one discipleship relationship that Jesus had uh, with him. I've, 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 I've thought, why did Jesus from the cross choose to hand over the care of his mother to John, not even to his brother, but to, to John? And again, I'm, I'm drawn to this concept of John's love that beautiful picture that we have at the last supper uh, of the, the the disciples reclining which is what you did in those days to eat at the table but john resting with his head on the breast of christ a beautiful picture of friendship and of intimacy so we have jesus with the 12 and the three and the one but we could expand it out the other direction as well i think could we not so not just the 12 but we might want to start to think about the 70 or the 72 depends on which uh, of of the gospels you're reading that jesus sends out in pairs please note in team uh, the, the number 70 or 72 is, is interesting in that it reflects the then known number of nations of the world. So it's, it's symbolic of the message of Christ and the disciples of Christ going into all the world, part of the Great Commission of Matthew 28, which we'll come on to in a few moments' time. So we have the 12, the 3 and the 1, but we also have the 70 or 72, or the 120 who gather together and, and, and deserve a particular mention in Scripture. Maybe even the 500 people that Jesus appears to post-resurrection, I don't imagine for a moment that they were any kind of random old gathering. of. I think Jesus would have been very careful about who he appeared to post-resurrection. The 500, you might want to even think about the elements of teaching and discipleship that Jesus did to the, the feeding of the 5,000 and, and so on and so on. So what we begin to see in the life and times of Christ uh, is, that, is that discipleship is biblical, it's not fanciful, it's not stylistic, um, and it's a kind of a, a, dis- a mentoring matrix, different levels of intensity and 
time and investment across the numbers that we've just briefly looked at. So there's my first proposition that New Testament discipleship, biblical discipleship, it, it, you find it all the way through scripture. It's not an in phrase. It's not just the thing that DNA does. It's utterly biblical. The second proposition that I would have of the five when it comes to discipleship is that discipleship is not only biblical, not fanciful, it's also vital. It's not optional. So if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, then actually we don't have an option. We must be involved uh, in discipleship. And, and I guess for this I go to perhaps uh, one of the most obvious places uh, in the New Testament. And, uh, and I'll read, uh, if I may, from the very end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, which whatever version we look at is so famous that it's probably got the same subheading, the Great Commission. Now these are, as we have them, the last recorded words of Christ on the earth before he goes off like a skyrocket to be back uh, with his father in heaven. And, and, and one might imagine uh, that you would be very careful after three years of ministry and post-resurrection that you'd be very careful what, what your closing words, your closing comments, your final address would be uh, to your disciples. So there is great weight and emphasis, I think, in what Jesus leaves his disciples with. Let's just read this uh, together from Matthew 28, uh, picking in uh, uh, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples, obviously we've lost one by now because Judas has betrayed Christ and gone out and uh, hanged himself. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I want to just draw some, I think, some key lessons for us, for me, for our trainees, for you, for your church, from, from this little passage on uh, the Great Commission. I suppose the first thing to say is obvious, isn't it, that this is the Great Commission of Christ and it has not yet been fulfilled. So we're still working out the Great Commission. It's still in place. And not only is it unfulfilled, but it's also unrevoked. God has never cancelled this one. Jesus never said, oh, do you know what, there would have been a better way to do it, let's start again. No, it's unrevoked and it's unfulfilled. And so we've still got work to do uh, to inhabit and inherit uh, this stuff about making disciples. And then I'm straight into uh, the text. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And that speaks to me of two things. First of all, it speaks to me of obedience. So Jesus has said, go there, guys, and they've got, they've done as he instructed them to do. And so the, the giving of the great commission to make disciples is birthed in the context of obedience. And that's a challenge to me and it's a challenge to our trainees, it's a challenge to you and to your church, that we follow Christ in obedience. Whatever, as, as the mother of Christ said at the first miracle at Cana, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So here's the Great Commission birthed in the context of obedience. But more than that, it's very specific, isn't it? It's not just that they obeyed him, but they went to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So the giving of the Great Commission of Discipleship in the New Testament is in the context of obedience, but it's also in the context of the right time at the right place. And we find year on year in DNA that this is about catching the right time and the right place in the lives of the trainees and interns that God gives to us and gives us to. It's about a key moment, a, there's two types of time talked about in the Bible. God talks about chronos time, which is measured time, seasons and days, weeks and months and so on. But there is a more important kind of time in the New Testament, which is kairos time, how God seems to measure time by gleaming moments of God's intervention, the acceptable day or moment 
of the Lord. And here we've got God's intervention into their lives at the right time and the right place. And DNA is very much about that. Uh, and I would urge you to think within your church, uh, who are the people uh, that need this time and this moment to be invested in by God, that they might become more whole, that they might become more fruitful, that it might be the women and men of God breaking through for God, that he's called them to be inheriting their destiny because they're committed to development. And of course, in the Bible, development equals discipleship. So discipleship in the New Testament is based in the context of obedience and being the right place, the right time. Uh, and then the next little bit I love as well in verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him. So the context of uh, the Great Commission to make disciples is also to do with worship. Now, the word that's used here is the word proskino from the root proskuneo. Uh, which does mean worship, uh, it literally means to rush towards, to embrace, or to kiss, to fall down at the feet of, to give worship to. Uh, it's a very intimate word, actually. And we know, don't we, that, 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 that worship is not about style, that worship is not about whether we sing upbeat songs or quiet songs, whether we stand still with our arms at our sides or from a hymn book or from a PowerPoint, whether we raise our hands or whether we do a charismatic two-hop. Or... Worship is not about style. Worship is about who we are. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 gives a definition of worship, that we yield ourselves, we surrender ourselves to God uh, and th that our minds are renewed and we become transformed. This yielding, says Romans 12, is our spiritual act of worship. Worship is our lifestyle. And so DNA is about that and discipleship is about that. But then it goes on to say, but some doubted. And I love this, I love this because Doing a year like DNA really is a journey with its highs and its lows and there are times when some of our trainees uh, to hopefully you and your churches may send to us to have them back placed in your church for a year will hit the highs but also the lows. The highs have a great vantage point and a viewpoint but it's in the lows, in the valleys, that that's where the fruit is. Nothing grows on the top of the mountains. It's in the lows and, it's, and actually to, to read this, that after three years with Christ, they see his resurrected body and some still doubt and that that is okay because of what happens next. Some doubted and then Jesus came to them. Now, if you look at the original language there, that might mean he went to all 11, but it more probably means he went to the ones who doubted. So allowing Christ to draw alongside us in our discipleship journey, in the highs and in the lows. And then Jesus comes to them and gives them all authority. The word is exousias, it's a, it's, a, it's a legal word actually, a court word. All authority is given in heaven and on earth to me, says Jesus, and therefore you go. I always thought it was a bit strange. You got the authority, why do we go? Well, we go in his name. And what is the command to make disciples te ethne of all the nations literally of all the people groups and all the rest that follows baptizing them of the name of the father son and holy spirit and then teaching them to obey everything that jesus taught his first disciples so and so we begin to see the cascade the ripple out effect of discipleship from the original great commission jesus teaches the disciples but they're to go and teach them the next lot everything that he taught them and then so they go to the next lot and so the great commission rolls out and it settles today on you and me this is our call and our commission and then jesus says and in that context something that we'd love to say is true for us in that context says jesus as you make disciples then i am with you always to the very end of the age so discipleship is biblical it's not fanciful or stylistic it's vital it's not merely optional the third thing i want to say about uh, new testament discipleship is this it's perpetual it's not temporal it's not temporary it, it doesn't stop it goes on and it goes on its rhythm may change its nature may change its emphasis may change the people discipling us may change but we don't ever graduate from the Jesus School of Discipleship. Uh, and the stuff that in my early days as a Christian I was being discipled with in, in areas of accountable relationship, issues of sin in my life, of temptation, of insecurities and fears, 
many of those are not now the issues that I'm dealing with now, but I'm still dealing with stuff now. The people who discipled me then are not the people who are discipling me now. Those things change. But the need for discipleship does not change. We don't say, oh yeah, our church runs a discipleship course, or yeah, we did Alpha and now we have a beta group to disciple them and it runs for 10 weeks, or oh, discipleship, yeah, that's for the young people in their youth group. It's for all of us, all of the time. Discipleship is perpetual, it's not temporary or temporal. The fourth thing I wanna say about the nature of New Testament discipleship is this. It's intentional. It's not accidental. In fact, I'd push that a stage further. If we don't intentionally make discipleship happen in our lives and then through our lives to others, it won't happen at all. It, it won't accidentally happen. We have to be intentional in this to make space for it and create desire uh, for it. The disciples, um, are, they are not born they're made. Disciples are made, not born, not even just born again. They are made. Do you know, I truly believe it's possible to, 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 to love Jesus and be forgiven of your sins and inherit an eternal destiny with God and yet not be a disciple. But the call is to discipleship in the here and now, not just the there and then. And so I think that every last one of us, starting with me, need to be able to answer the question, who is my Paul? You know, that's another example, isn't it, out of the New Testament, Paul and Timothy. We can think of loads of examples. But Paul discipled Timothy. So who is my Paul? Who's shaping a disciple? Who knows everything about me, the good stuff and the not so good stuff, and still loves me and is committed to me and will encourage me and will ask me the hard questions because I've intentionally permissioned them to do that. Who's my Paul? And the other question, of course, is who's my Timothy? Who am I discipling? And I'd urge you to think about those questions. Who's discipling you and who are you discipling? And can we serve you either in your own discipleship or in your discipling of others as you produce leaders through your church? And so discipleship is intentional and not accidental. And here's the last thing that I would say about my understanding of the nature of New Testament discipleship. At its heart, it is relational, it's not merely informational. Now, it, information's great, and, and we teach trainees how to grapple with scripture, what it is and what it is not, and, and we, we, we seek to give them tools rather than just answers so that they can grapple for themselves with, with understanding. It's discipleship of their head, their understanding, their theology. It's discipleship of their hands, their, their giftings and their skills. But predominantly it's discipleship of their character, of their heart, who they are in Christ. And so at its heart, New Testament discipleship is relational and not merely informational. I'll finish by mentioning the two key words that we, we find in, in, the, in the New Testament for the word disciple. The first is the word mathetes, that's the predominant word. And a, a mathetes, a disciple, literally means a learner-doer, one who learns as they go. So they do learn, but they learn as they go. They learn on the job, not hived away in some sort of theoretical place full of books and theories. The only good theology is theology in practice. So a mathetes is a learner doer. But the other main word in the New Testament that uh, gets translated disciple, discipling, and sometimes teaching, exhorting, and so on, is the word didasco, from the root word didache, as in didactic, to teach. And that at its heart, that word means this, to repeatedly extend the hand of friendship looking for acceptance. And there you have the heart of God's way of discipling. To repeatedly, going again and again, to persist, to repeatedly extend the hand of what? Friendship, it's relational. To win and woo the hearts, not to deliver rules and regulations. To repeatedly extend the hand of friendship looking for acceptance, nothing that can be taken or enforced, but looking to journey together. And I think when you put those five things together, 
that, that discipleship is biblical, it's not fanciful or merely stylistic, it's vital, it's not optional, it's perpetual, it's not temporal, it's intentional, it's not accidental, it's relational, it's not informational. When you put those five things together, then I think we're in a place to begin to journey in, in discipleship with Christ. And certainly as DNA, we're in a place where we so long to serve you and your church on that journey and on that process. I hope that's been helpful. Thank you for listening.